Hello, everyone. Good morning. I am Bob Allison, the chair of the Revolution 250 Advisory Committee, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. Revolution 250 is a consortium of seven, more than 70 organizations looking for ways to commemorate the Boston, Amer the American Revolution. And it, of course, it all began in Boston, but that's a subject we've been typically downplay, but not today, because we have with us today the person who made Evacuation Day a Boston holiday, and that is Colonel Henry Knox. Colonel Knox, thank you for joining us. How do you do, Mr. Allison? I'm delighted to see you, sir. It's great to have you with us today. And of course, the big event of 1776 was the British evacuation of Boston made possible by the heavy artillery that you brought from Fort Ticonderoga. Can you tell us a little bit about that noble train of artillery? Well, um, we didn't have any real heavy weapons um, while we were besieging Boston, which put us at pretty much of a stalemate. But uh, there had been the fortuitous capture of Fort Ticonderoga up at the base of Lake Champlain. And it had been probably the principal British fort in North America for about a hundred years. And over that period of time, it had acquired quite a, a cache of arms. They were in our hands, but they were also 300 miles away. Um, and General Washington uh, asked me whether I thought that I could go and pick out a reasonable assortment of armament for the artillery and get it to Boston. Um, and for some reason, possibly my naivete of being 25 years old, I said, yes, sir. And we set off and uh, my principal aide was my 19 year old brother, William. And we went to Ticonderoga we chose the artillery, 59 pieces of artillery. Um, people today would say cannon, but they weren't all cannon, in fact. Not all large pieces of artillery that shot uh, uh, weapons uh, were our cannon. We had mortars, cannon, long guns, siege guns. Uh, one thing, unfortunately, they were not, since they were all fortification weapons, is that they were not carriage guns. They did not have wheeled or conventional wheeled carriages. Um, so to get 58 metric tons of cannons to Boston, um, I had sleds built, very large, heavy timber sleds to be drawn by teams of oxen and uh, hired a lot of um, Teamsters, not today's Teamsters, but from which they are descended. Um, and we started the weaponry out in boats down Lake Champlain, down Lake George. And then we uh, toted them down the uh, side of the Hudson River. Um, and strangely enough, initially, we headed due south. Um, and then we hit Kinderhook, New York, a town of an interesting name. And we took a sharp left turn and headed east with our sights on Boston. Um, I think the first Massachusetts town that I recall was Great Barrington. And of course, we went to Springfield was our target. Well, Springfield was as far as the New York Teamsters wanted to go away from home. So they all left us at that point by mutual agreement. But uh, then we recruited a bunch of Teamsters in the area of Springfield and headed off and hit Worcester and Framingham and Watertown and eventually arrived in Cambridge. Um, the people knew we were coming. Uh, we made quite an appearance in all the towns we went through. Um, the train of artillery at most times, even at good distance, was about a mile long. 
And uh, we had to hold up on a number of occasions because we could only move if the roads were frozen. If we got a spate of good weather, as we've been having off and on uh, around here of late, <laughs> the roads would thaw and turn to a soup of mud that we could not drag them through. Our other <coughs> major challenge was downhills. Downhills was exceedingly dangerous and difficult. And the only way to get um, each one of these uh, sleds weighed approximately a, t a ton and a half, just 3,000 pounds. So we would put heavy ropes on them and belay them around trees and have the crew let them down the hill. Um, so this was actually the oxen at the top of the rope moving backwards to uh, to let the, the things down. Anyway, um, John Adams uh, met us in, um, as I recall, was Framingham and welcomed us. And once we got to Cambridge, um, there was the matter of dispersing the armament. Now, along with the cannons, which everyone can envision, there was any number of accoutrements. A cannon is not very useful if you don't have a ramrod, you don't have a screw, you don't have a sponge. Um, why do you need a sponge with a cannon? Because after you fire it, there's all kinds of little hot pieces of leftover powder in there. And if you put another charge in on it, you're going to get it right back in your face. So every time after you fire a cannon, you take a wet sponge on a long stick and run it down and drown the, uh, the sparks in there. Um, in any case, some of the cannon went to Cambridge, um, where Fort Washington still exists on the banks of the Charles River. Um, some of it went to Leachmere, um, where um, we had held our line after uh, Bunker Hill. And the bulk of it, um, about 53 um, weapons were taken all around Boston and uh, ended up on Dorchester Heights. And uh, on the evening of March 4th, I'm getting away from the train at this point, but if this is fine as you, the, you're telling it the way you remember it on the evening of March 4th. Um, we had had hundreds of volunteers, militia and neighbors and even children who had, um, collected, um, a lot of saplings and twigs and rocks and things on the backside of the hill out of sight of the town. Um, and they had made um, something that we called gabions. And what gabions were, essentially, they were large baskets. By large, I mean they were five feet tall and about three and a half feet in diameter, um, made out of saplings. Um, and the other thing was hogsheads. We collected all the hogsheads we could. Now, Can you tell us uh, what a hogshead is? I don't think our listeners yes. today may know it that is, term. It is not Christmas dinner with an apple in its mouth, in fact. A hogshead is a very large barrel. Um, and um, a hogshead is a barrel that, uh, that you, Mr. Allison, would have very little trouble getting into. Um, Henry Knox, on the other hand, might have a tight fit <laughs> in a hogshead. But in any case, in the middle of the night on uh, March 4th, we brought all these gabions and hogsheads up, lined them up facing the town, put the cannons in between them. The um, hogsheads were full of large rocks and the uh, gabions were filled with dirt and rock and one thing or another. Well, the gabions were basically a defensive weapon the hogsheads had another reason. This was a steep hill. If the British tried to climb this hill to attack us, we would turn these hogsheads over and roll them down the hill mm. at, wow. at the advancing troops. Uh, so they were actually an offensive weapon, um, mm. although they did add to the profile that we offered. <laughs> 
on the morning of March 5th, the sun came up, the British looked up, and there was a bristling array of cannons pointed at them. Now, they weren't really worried about the town because it wasn't their town. It was our town. What they were worried about was their fleet was anchored below us in the South Bay, which no longer exists. But at that time, the British Navy is what made their nation the empire that it was, made it the strongest force on the face of the earth at the time. And there we were overlooking them. Now, the fact that we overlook them is important because naval guns cannot elevate that high so that very few of their weapons had any chance of reaching us. It was too distant for their land-based artillery down at uh, Dorchester and Roxbury Neck. Uh, so we were essentially out of reach, which was different from the battle at Breeze Hill because their, their northern artillery batteries could reach Charlestown from, uh, from Boston. Well, we, uh, we hung there with some apprehension. Uh, to see what they would do. And on the evening of the 6th, we could clearly see that they were loading boats with assault forces. And uh, this is when um, the Lord above appeared to have been a patriot because out of nowhere uh, sprung a nor'easter. And we all know nor'easters uh, these days. Well, it's scattered and threatened their boats. And I think what it did is it gave the generals an, an opportunity to reconsider because they were thinking back at that point to Bunker Hill. Well, Breeds, uh, well, Dorchester Heights was higher. It was steeper. It was closer to the beach where they would have to land. There were more troops, more militia, more Americans there, and there were many more guns. In fact, from their perspective, there were many more guns than there were, in fact, because we had put a number of painted logs up there to simulate cam cannons. Incidentally, they're a lot easier to move than real <laughs> cannons are. So, they sent a message, and they sent a message with their uh, accustomed hubris to Mr. George Washington, um, which was a calculated insult. And they suggested to Mr. George Washington that if he would refrain from harassing their efforts to depart, that they would leave Boston which in effect meant that they would leave Massachusetts, that they would leave their second oldest colony in North America of their own free will, uh, conditioned only that we did not disturb their departure. Well, their departure is what we fondly hoped for, so we were only too ready to agree, <clears throat> in spite of the fact that we knew full well that the armada over 50 ships of sail that they had amassed for this departure was busily stealing everything that they had not already burned during the siege. Um, um, my acquaintance John Rowe had his warehouses emptied. Um, my own bookstore um, ended up mainly in London um, later. On the other well, it hand- It was the London bookshop. Huh? It was, it the, was London the London book. Book. I guess they thought it was appropriate, right? Um, in any case, eventually they did sail away, although they didn't sail far, uh, strangely enough. Um, they sailed out to the roads where they rode an anchor for about three days, where reportedly they gathered on their flagship and tried to decide what they were going to do. Um, eventually, they turned north and they sailed to Newfoundland, which was of little concern to us, um, 
I think our first, our only concern in that regard was that our um, watchers reported that they had not sailed south. There was some considerable concern that they would sail south to New York. So they actually sailed out of what would become the United States of America. And uh, in fact, they never returned hmm. in any form. The British never occupied hmm. any of Massachusetts thereafter. Um, well, let me take that back as a, as a man who, who ended his life in comfort in uh, Thomaston, Maine, and given that Maine at that time was a part of Massachusetts, I can't say they entirely left. It took mm. several years to discourage their forays into Maine. But mm. um, subsequent to that, the war um, tended to move south mm -hmm. um, and never, never returned here. Although Massachusetts still contain, continued to be a major thrust of British war strategy. Um, and some of their major mistakes that helped us win the war were their continued attempts to flank New England and cut it off from the rest of the colonies. They, mm -hmm. they had the strong idea, which had a lot of merit to it, that it was Boston and Massachusetts that was driving all 13 of the colonies into rebellion and, and revolt. Um, they always thought the further south they got in, in South Carolina and Georgia, et cetera, that, that the people were just waiting with bated breaths for enough British force to show up to, to turn against um, the United Colonies. But uh, so, I mean, their whole, um, Burgoyne campaign down from Canada and Fort Ticonderoga, which met disastrous end in Saratoga, was intended to cut off New England. Um, the, the fact that the British forces in New York were meant to strike up the Hudson River um, to uh, join up with, with Burgoyne's forces was all intended to cut off um, New England and their disaster at Saratoga, uh, of course, we all know, encouraged the for the French to uh, join the war on our side. And uh, in the meantime, um, as a result of all this, um, <laughs> General Washington had made me a colonel on the first day that I was in the army. I was, in fact, at Bunker Hill, but it's purely as a volunteer without any commission. So, in fact, I joined the Army as a colonel. That's good. Now, we, Colonel, you had also been recently married at this time, if I'm not mistaken. I, I've been married for about two and a half, uh, possibly three years um, mm. at that time. Um, my dear wife, Lucy, who was the best thing that ever happened to Henry Knox, um, was the daughter of the colonial secretary of the colony of Massachusetts Bay. The very man who had been sent to Salem to disband the uh, colonial assembly of uh, Massachusetts. Um, and she had the, um, what sounds to our ears today, unusual name of Lucy Flucker. And uh, Lucy, was a very independent young lady, um, which is what it took to be married to Henry Knox. And her parents were not at all pleased that she had insisted on marrying me. And at the outbreak of the war, um, those British ships that I was so anxiously awaiting the departure of 245 years ago, carried away every relative that my Lucy had. And I regret to say that she never heard of one of them again for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. Although that 
pleasant estate that we ended our lives in in Thomaston, Maine, had in fact been her father's grant of land. And uh, given the fact that I had joined this army at 25 and went on throughout the entire war and then took the position of Secretary of War um, under President Washington, um, I had spent most of my time being paid little and frequently nothing. And so the, um, the pension that awaited us was in fact this land grant up in Maine. And in fact, you can still visit my house up in Thomaston, Maine, which is a, which is a pleasant uh, tour on things. Um, and the house has a very pleasant name as well. Montpelier. Yes. Montpelier, yes. Um, I, I think that I was inspired by my time um, in the new federal government by my colleagues, um, General Washington and Thomas Jefferson and uh, um, James Madison. They all had very impressive and uh, luxurious homes. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Maine, um, I endeavored for all her sacrifices to give my Lucy something equivalent. Um, I must say that my Lucy bore me 13 children and only saw three of them grow up. Mm. Um, wow. Which is a, which is a terrible mm. tragedy in life. Mm -hmm. um, and however, interestingly enough, my grandson, a little known fact, my grandson, Henry Knox Thatcher was the um, United States Admiral in the Civil War in command of the Gulf of Mexico and was the individual to whom the Confederate Navy surrendered personally at hmm. the end of the Civil War. Wow. So that was an interesting counterpoint to yes. the contributions of the Knox family to mm -hmm. the to securing what we had founded in 1783. Amazing. Great story. Now, uh, a colonel, later general, and an admiral, and you talked about your naivete. I, yeah, I was a general, incidentally, just, just to make modern military people jealous. I was a general only nine months after evacuation <laughs> day. Wow. So you entered the army as a colonel, and then nine months later or so were a general. Within a year, I was a general, yes. So, well, um, now there must have been, did, what, did you have any background? How had you come to understand military science sufficient that Washington would entrust you with this mission? Uh, a very interesting question, sir. Um, my father was not very successful in life, and he, like many New Englanders, went off to sea to try to seek his fortune to care for his family and was never heard from again. Um, throughout my youth, I assumed that he had been lost in an accident at sea. Um, in my old age, I have learned that he, in fact, never meant it to, never went to sea. He simply moved a couple of colonies. Um, south of here and lived out his life. In any case, we were out of, were without a father. Um, as a middling teenager, I had to go to work to support, help su my mother support our family. And one of the early jobs that I got was working in a bookstore. I found this quite enjoyable. It also allowed me to continue my interrupted education with all these books around to read. I eventually opened my own bookstore, the old London bookstore um, down by the wharfs in, in Boston. And I had a great fascination with military matters and particularly with fortifications and, arm, and 
and artillery. And so I purchased for my store every uh, leading European manual and treatise on fortifications and artillery um, that I could get in several languages. And I had a number of other militia um, members who came to my store to sit and read and discuss um, these volumes. And we got quite a lively book group going. As a matter of fact, I have characterized it as America's first military academy. Um, among the people who arrived quite frequently were John Stark, um, later the um, senior military member of the uh, New Hampshire uh, militia, the left wing at the Battle of Breeze Hill, um, and uh, and the Nathan hero of Bennington. Huh? The hero of Bennington. Yes, yes. And and um, Nathaniel Green from Rhode Island, um, who, in my opinion, was one of the five best generals of the Patriot side in the Revolutionary War, and who ironically had been raised a Quaker. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, when he formed his first... Um, what we could, would call Minutemen uh, Company in Rhode Island, because he was a Quaker, they wouldn't elect him an officer. So he was actually originally a corporal in his own uh, company. As soon as the shooting started, they made him a colonel. So <laughs> it, it worked out well. But no, I had learned all this by voracious reading and collecting and having the ability as an importer of books to get the treatises that I wanted. And so um, it was it was book learned. I had, mm. uh, I had no practical experience at all. I was too young to have been engaged in the French and Indian Wars. Um, I did drill with the local Boston Artillery Company, but as actual practical experience, I had none. I was, mm. I was totally, book educated, but they asked me to work on the fortifications at the beginning of the siege of Boston. And I constructed, designed and constructed the fortifications at Roxbury Neck, which I called it at the time. And, uh, and General Washington, upon taking command, uh, made a, a circuit of Boston to survey the things and was reportedly very impressed with my fortifications there, which caused him to inquire uh, about me on things. And when the job of bringing 58 tons of armament 300 miles uh, over mountains and, uh, and waters, um, frankly, my physique may have had something to do with it. Because at that time, I was uh, right in the neighborhood of 280, 290 pounds. Um, I was six foot three. Um, and uh, so I don't know whether he thought my artillery knowledge was more useful than my physical <laughs> presentation, but somehow the combination made him choose me. No, actually, one of uh, Revolution 250's chief supporters has been the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati. And I know you were involved in creating that venerable organization in 1783. Can you tell us a bit about the Cincinnati? The Cincinnati, the Society of the Cincinnati was organized in 1783 at our encampment in New York. Um, by the officers of the continental forces of the revolution. And I emphasize that strange construct because it did not include the militia officers. And it was in essence a mutual aid society. One has to recall that the continental officers, in other words, Washington's officers um, at every rank, 
had not been paid for three to three and a half years at the end of the war. Um, and they were, many of them in dire straits. In fact, many of the heroes of our revolution never recovered financially um, from their sac sacrifice. Not only did they do service, not only did they leave their families and their farms and their businesses, but many of them had in fact bankrolled the, the regiments that they commanded. They had provided weapons and shoes and uniforms and et cetera. So they were not only at ground zero, they were below ground on things. And so the Society of the Cincinnati was formed for the mutual um, support of their brother officers um, in the army at the end of the war. And it was named the Society of the Cincinnati after a very famous Roman, and you have to understand that the majority of the officers of the American Revolution generally read and read and spoke Greek and Latin. They were all, to the extent that they were trained, they were classically trained. Um, there are probably a lot of other things they could have studied, but that was the, the form in those days. And so they were all aware of one Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus, who twice left his plow in the field and went to take command of the Roman legions when Rome was endangered um, by invasion by various and sundry outside forces. On both occasions, he saved Rome, turned back the invaders. In both cases, he was offered to become the the dictator of Rome, and in both cases, he politely declined and went back to his plow and his farm. Therefore, our classically trained ancestors considered him the quintessential citizen soldier, and that's how they viewed themselves. And therefore, they classified themselves as the Society of the Cincinnati. And just for the record, Cincinnati, Ohio was named after the society, not vice versa. Well, the society still exists. Um, to be a member of it, you have to be the eldest direct lineal descendant of a qualified officer of the Continental Forces. And the qualification is that you must have been discharged under honorable circumstances with at least three years of service or two. Then there are a lot of oars. <laughs> or mm -hmm. at the end of the war, or to have died or been incapacitated, etc. But essentially, it's three years of continental service. Eldest direct lineal descendant can be a member. And over the years, the purpose of the society has morphed into um, one of honoring and educating about the principles and um, ethics of the people who created this country. And in that regard, in the last few years, we have started something called the American Revolution Institute. Um, you can find the Society of the Cincinnati or the American Revolution Institute online. Isn't it strange for a man who's 270 years old to be referring you uh, to something online? Um, teachers, if there's any teachers out there listening, more and more really good content on the revolutionary period um, is available. It's all freely available to teachers to use. And uh, so that's what we're that's what we're doing uh, these days on the Society of the Cincinnati. Well, thank you very much, Colonel Knox, for joining us this morning. You look and sound remarkably good for a man of 270 years of age. It's only because I am sitting down, sir. Good, good. And so I want to thank you for helping us to both honor and educate, honor the uh, those who served and educate those who need to know this story. So thank you so much. And I hope we can have you back. And I also hope at some point 
we can have someone you would very much like to meet, J. Archer O'Reilly III, one of the most extraordinary people I know, join us to tell us more about what he has been up to. And so thank you for joining us. And thank you to Jonathan Lane, our producer. And uh, now we will have our musicians, Doug Quigley and Dave and Peter Emmerich, pipe us out with a tune familiar to Colonel Knox, The Road to Boston. In salute of evacuation day. Thank you. March the 17th.